to Tales of Praxis, everybody. I am the newly lonely Aaron Saduko because my friend and colleague Dan Hughes is back in his homeland of San Antonio. Dan, it was great having you. Uh, I know that everyone on stream enjoyed you. Uh, I, I will hope that they also enjoyed our banter. I'm less willing to own up to my own contribution to the banter. Uh, but one thing you can always count for, count on from Dan is his ability to rouse the audience with his wit and insights. So I'm glad that I was able to show you all that for the week. Uh, and we're already in conversations about ways to do more collaborations uh, and work on the stream together. So hopefully you can look forward to that. Uh, but I am delighted to be back with you today. We're continuing on what is now the back half of Tales of Symphonia, Dawn of the New World. It's also a pretty great day and first day of May for me uh, with regard to everything gaming and with the terrible fate. Uh, and even in terms of Tales of Praxis, this particular series that we're doing studying Bandai Namco's Tales JRPGs, because finally, after literally at least like five years of wanting to write something uh, reflecting my views on Tales of the Abyss and at least six weeks of actually working on the production of it. I published uh, what is, I don't want to say will be my definitive view on Tales of the Abyss, but at the very least encapsulates a lot of why I think the game is really special and why I've been drawn back to it over the years uh, in some pretty mystifying but rewarding ways. So I hope you all have a chance to check that out. Uh, I'll drop a link in the VOD and everything like that, but it's the first featured article on WithTheTerribleFate.com. So if you're a fan of Tales of the Abyss, if you want to get another window into why this series is so rewarding and so cool and so literary, honestly, uh, I think that Tales of the Abyss is a great case study for that, and I've tried to dive into that in the article. So uh, if anyone stops by who has happened to check that out already, more than happy to make this stream a bit of a conversation about that article too because it really was a labor of love uh, as is everything that we do on with a terrible fate but for now we're diving back into the adventure of marta and emil i confess i had to uh, refresh myself with the synopsis but we're still on the hunt for the core of the centurion of ice Gla glacius glacius i don't remember the way to pronounce it but i'm sure they will remind us uh that sent us to Meltokio because the shopkeeper of the accessory shop in Flanor, his son uh, went ahead to Meltokio to presumably try to sell it, I think. We discovered that on the last stream. Uh, we went to Meltokio. We were on the way to try to figure out uh, where the core had been disseminated to amongst the nobles uh, or elsewhere. We ran into Alice who tried to make a play to attack the party. Uh, Tenebrae ended up sacrificing himself to save the town and the party from Alice's exploding monster, which means that we are now on a journey to reconstitute Tenebrae from his core at the Temple of Darkness before we return to our journey to find the other Centurion's cores. So not gonna spend too much longer than that on a recap. I say let's dive in and get Tenebrae back and see what happens next in this wild adventure. Before we do that, priorities. Uh, I think I forgot a Wonder Chef recipe in Meltokio, so we're going to grab that real quick. This is the danger of running with a, uh, with a side quest guide is you totally get your priorities slanted. But you get to find a lot of cool JRPG flavored surprises along the way. So there's that. I also tried as best as possible to fix um, the microphone levels and game audio levels now that the setup is back to one person as opposed to the dual setup from last week. So if it's not perfectly balanced, just let me know and I'm happy to play with that. Dessert. It's a good one. I also wasn't sure whether my little girl Evie was going to be more or less frustrated with my solo streaming relative to the duo streaming of last week, now that Dan is gone. 
but it sounds like she's telling me she's more frustrated, so I apologize on her behalf. But we know from experience that she usually settles. Alright. Now we are on to the Temple of Darkness. Let's do it. Oh, we should probably rest at the inn first. Since I always forget, and then it bites me in the butt. Stopping someone to get those. I should make sure that Marta also is on auto now that there's only one person here. And hilarious, even though she kept defaulting to auto when Dan was here and we were doing two player, now that Dan is not here, she's defaulting to semi auto. Hilarious. Hey, Chrissy, welcome back. Good to see you. How you doing? Welcome back to the stream. We're just warming up and going through the preliminary motions, so you haven't missed anything yet. Except my talking about how I'll miss Dan and how I'm relieved to have finally published that study on Tales of the Abyss. Uh, you do not have to apologize for PhD nonsense. I apologize to you for PhD nonsense. That does not sound fun. <laughs> Is the nonsense in the rearview mirror, at least? Or is it ongoing? Um, oh yeah, my week with Dan was fantastic. Thank you for asking. Um, we schemed a lot of new stuff to do for With a Terrible Fate. And caught up on some fun collaborative gaming even outside the stream. We watched some good shows. Uh, and, you know, it occurred to us that it had probably been at least six months since we had hung out in person, which is unusual for us, despite the fact that we live in different places now, so it was long overdue. Always nice to see an old friend. Oh, okay, we can't even accept quests now. I was anticipating another side quest to do in this chapter. But I'll have to check back in once we have Tenebrain. Just one. Items first. Here we go. Right. Okay, now that we're adequately equipped, let's go save Tenebra. Oh, thank you. I am honored to play the role of your coffee reading. I hope that you find it interesting. It's funny, I forget whether I talked about this on stream, but as you know, when I set out to do this Tales of Praxis series, my initial thought for the articles was, oh, I'll do these short, weekly, serialized pieces, very similar to what I did for Majora's Mask way back when With a Terrible Fate started, eight years ago or whenever that was. And so that was kind of the spirit of the first article that we did on Tales of Symphonia. And then I had all of these separate ideas uh, in this big Google Doc for Tales of the Abyss. But the more I started to look at them and think about them, the more like no matter which thread I pulled at, it kind of pulled me into this broader analysis because it all tied back for me um, to I can feel the presence. way in which the game was playing with these ideas of Kabbalah and making sort of a, a gaming experience that is spiritually richer, I think, than the typical game in light of that. And all of which to say it ended up being like... I think probably about a 15,000 word analysis, which actually keeps me on pace in terms of uh, if I were writing an article that was the size of the first Tales of Symphonia one every week. But uh, now that that is out, and I hope that everyone appreciates it, uh, I, I'm hoping at least without making any promises to go back to more succinct, bite-sized windows into why these games are really cool, um, starting with some of the many topics that we talked about with Tales of Symphonia before this. So that should be fun. Really? I forgot that Emil was in, uh, had stayed in Radatosk mode since Tenebrae left. It's bright enough to see in here without the blue candle. Must be because Shadow's gone. Blue candle? When Shadow was in this temple, it was pitch black. Without it, we couldn't see a thing. 
one of the more obscure, um, not an Easter egg, what would you call that, like a MacGuffin? Um, tools to access a dungeon from the first game that there's no way I would remember if I hadn't just played that before this. Who cares? Let's go. <laughs> you know, I'm finding it pretty difficult to warm up to a meal in Ratatosk mode. I feel like a meal is just offering a much more blunt way of saying what I just said about the blue candle. Sheena. Who cares? Uh, right, sorry. I know he is Emil. But anyway, come on, let's go. I guess it makes sense that the Temple of Darkness would be so dark. Are you scared? N not scared, exactly. Dark places always make you wonder what might be hiding in them. There isn't much that scares me, though, thanks to all the training I've been through. Sheena, there's something on your back. Ah! What? What is it? it? It was just a cobweb. Oh, c cobwebs, right. Don't startle me like that. That's some training. Oh, anything exciting on the roadmap? Uh, it's a good question. I'm thinking about what, Dear if anything, Alice, I want to tease. How could she do this um, to Tenebrae? Next time I see her, well, Dan is continuing on with his audio right series, <laughs> Pokemon Rose, all soft. about sort of his I'd nostalgic perspective on Pokemon the through the years. And without taking the wind from his sails or stealing his thunder in terms of future content, I can tell you he has some really cool topics coming up in the next few weeks. So I'm really selfishly excited to listen to those, and I hope that you'll enjoy them as well. I know I talked with you about this already, Chrissy, but I'm thinking my next article for Tales of Praxis is going to be on the experience of like accidentally making Regal Lloyd's best friend in my Tales of Symphonia playthrough that I streamed. And how the more I thought about that, the more that serendipity captures something for me that's really magical and I think underutilized in modern gaming. So I'm really excited to talk about that. Um, Camus, who ran the interview for um, the creator of Legend of Zelda Hero's Purpose, has some really neat ideas of some new studies and series to work on. I think he's basically waiting to be done with the academic year on his end, but I think that happens this month. So I'm going to just, without any pressure to him, tease that I am excited and hopeful that he will put together some really cool stuff. Sorry, Chrissy, I didn't get the uh, the reference of what you're talking about. What was the lovely turn? You're so amazing. Shut up. That was nothing. I love the way you said that. I'm not fighting anymore. Oh, the regal thing. Yes. Well, I had originally intended to... Um, I think I talked about this on the stream. Maybe you weren't on that stream, but... Um, very succinctly, there is a way to get Kratos back in your party in the late game, and so I had been planning and assuming I would be able to do that, and then I just, I totally missed it. Uh, but yes, I'm glad you thought it was lovely. I thought it was really lovely too, so I'm, I'm excited to dive into that. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, I think there's going to be a lot more of our bread and butter in terms of analysis. Uh, I am not on stream going to commit to writing something right away about the new Xenoblade Chronicles 3 DLC, but I will say that I am having quite a time playing through it, uh, and I already have a lot of thoughts, so take that however you like. I'm not going to say more about it yet. Um, but, I mean, one of the things that I love about you know, getting together with Dan and thinking about this stuff is we always think about potential new projects and ways to expand the scope of things, too. So, like, I'm really interested in exploring, for instance, um, like what it would look like for us to do some more podcasting, but to do it as live broadcasts over Twitch or something similar so that we could still record conversations and have it accessible via Spotify and, um, you know, Apple Podcasts and everything like that. But that if people were interested in listening in and asking questions and contributing, uh, it could be kind of more interactive in the same way that that interview we just did was interactive. So I think that could be a lot of fun. Um, 
I had still had this half scheme in my head for a long time about what it would look like to host kind of like a little mini online with a terrible fate like conference or even just some sort of like you know twitter driven forum or something about the storytelling of video games so that's a very nascent idea but that's you know one of the things that i'm really interested in as we're as we're growing the presence and i think honestly being able to uh get some more of the analysts playing some more games besides this tales of praxis series on twitch and kind of growing the um the live interactions and conversations in that way so that is a small not exhaustive list of uh, a lot of the stuff that i'm excited about Uh, not to your shame. I mean, I will, I'll openly admit that I had never heard of Sean McGarry either, um, nor of Hero's Purpose, but leave it to Camus. I mean, there are so many thoughtful gamers and creators out there, um, and Camus, like everyone else who's been through the analytical wings of with a terrible fate over the years, has a really great beat on just people who are thinking about game storytelling in interesting ways. Uh, actually, that was one of the things that I made Dan do while he was here. I sat him down and I said, you have to watch this entire web series, uh, this fan fiction on um, The Legend of Zelda, because it's such high quality and I know you'll love it. And surprise, surprise, he thought it was just, you know, really fascinating and a great take. So, yeah, if you enjoyed that, you should definitely check it out. And then, uh, yeah, check out the interview, because Sean's a really interesting guy. He had a ton of hard stuff to say. I already apologized for Evie once on stream before he showed up, I think, Chrissy, but I will apologize again because she is in rare form for Kako Demon. Hey, you gotta calm down. You have to calm down, alright? It's not playtime. It's not playtime. Well, it is playtime, but not playtime with you. Yeah, I'll tell you guys one of the many things that I loved about working on the article on Tales of the Abyss as well. Yes, it is absolutely the kind of thing that you will want to binge, uh, which I wasn't expecting, but once I sat down to watch it, it was like, I couldn't put it down. It's that good. Um, but yeah, I was going to say one of the things that I really loved about just the experience of working on the Tales of the Abyss article, because I think I talked about this on Twitter, but it was actually a really hard article for me to do, just in the sense that the focus of it is um, like mysticism and religious studies, right? The conceit is studying how um, the Jewish mystic tradition of Kabbalah um, like creates new layers to the act of playing the game. Uh, and that is very, very different than Western philosophy in terms of just the tradition and the way it's written about and like, the academic accessibility of it. And so I was just feeling very under-equipped for it, which I think was part of why it took so long uh, and why I was kind of just intimidated by the subject matter for a long time. So it was really hard to work with, um, but it was also really rewarding. I feel like true to a lot of the game analysis that I did, I learned a lot along the way. And one of the things that I loved in terms of kind of the metagame of writing the article, because I know we talked about the metagame of actually playing these games so often, is that... Um, after I kind of put my thoughts together, I reached out to an old buddy of mine, truly just one of the best people you'd ever meet, uh, by the name of Makabe, someone I knew from my undergrad days. We were actually in the same um, upperclassman house together at Harvard. Um, and he's a physics guy, but also huge into philosophy and religion. We actually met in a philosophy of quantum mechanics class back in the day. Um, and he has like, deep, deep experience and background in mysticism, and so uh, we connected over this draft with my basically saying, hey, can you, you know, help give me a read on whether this makes sense and give me some guidance on what to do, and I hadn't thought of it at the time, but that kind of added this whole new dimension to, like, the act of creating the article, because as you read it, you'll see a big part of, like, mystic practice in general, and Kabbalah's no exception here, is the idea of like working through these ideas in dialogue between the initiate, the newcomer to the tradition, and someone who can act as a teacher or a more seasoned practitioner who can kind of 
show them the way through practice. So it's much more about that dialogue and like call to action rather than just working through academic texts or something like this. Uh, and so kind of without realizing that I was doing it, by bringing my draft into conversation with Mockingbay and having all these amazing back and forth with him and dialogue about it and getting his two cents on what worked and what didn't and what I might want to expand on. I was kind of like doing a mystic practice of my own through that conversation with him. So I hope that kind of finds ways to show through in the final draft. Um, but whether or not it does, that was definitely one of those things where form really your content for me. Um, I felt like I was doing the thing that I was talking about in the article through the act of, of creating this and working with Makinde on that. So, Makinde, I've already shouted you out a few times on social media today, but love you, man. Your insights were really, really transformative. At least make it the study, but uh, it also turned the, the article drafting into much more just a creative experience for me, a narrative experience. So, thank you for that. Oh, I'm sorry it's going awry. I, um, well, well, hopefully at least tuning in and, uh, engaging with some of the Tales stuff can be a little cathartic or relaxing for you, but hope you know if you ever feel the need to, uh, vent or talk through more of the nitty-gritty of your PhD, I'm more than happy to be supportive for that stuff, too. Uh, I know more than the average bear about the various circles of academic hell, so... Uh, I can only imagine you're working through a lot. Actually, my uh, my buddy, another dear friend and colleague of mine who's done some great stuff for With a Terrible Fate before, Matt McGill, is visiting me on the backside of this week. So I haven't yet gotten confirmation as to whether or not he'll be down to stream. So I can't promise that, but look forward to me at least trying to talk him into joining the stream on Friday. But he... Uh, Literally just either last month or the month before, he finally finished his PhD in neuroscience, and so uh, he, he was very much in the throes of you know the good, the bad, and the ugly, and is happy to be out on the other side. So know that it does get better, and those things do end, <laughs> and sometimes they're even worth it. I'm kidding, I, I, I hope that you're still finding you know, joy and value in it, despite the. I know it can be a hard balance to strike for sure. The Labyrinthine NHS Ethics Process. Wow, that uh, that definitely sounds like a challenge. NHS is that uh, National Health Services? Uh, tell me, I mean, if you want, I'd love to hear more about kind of the, uh, the scope of the project and what it is that you're working on. Yeah. 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 I do feel like there's a steep At least make jump in difficulty in pretty much every one of these dungeons. More so than I was finding in uh, our Tales of Symphonia playthrough before this. Alright, Marta's got her Mystic Art now too. Everyone's hitting level 30. Got it, alright. I guess the acronym right. <laughs> I would not have bet on that. Yeah, I have no idea um, how it does or does not align with like doing grants and proposals that are tied to um, like government work in the US, but I know Again, just from conversation with my buddy Matt, who got, I think, at least a couple of grants for um, like government-sponsored science work here, but that can uh, definitely be a, a challenging, as you say, labyrinthine um, process to navigate. Well, we, uh, yeah, we have our own bureaucracy to wait for, but... Definitely when it comes to the health stuff, uh, less intuitive and probably less good for our society on a whole the way that many other countries do it. I would not be able to Should have never gone against me.
It's so weird to be back in a dungeon with all of the, uh, like, tools and utilities and kind of booby traps that we had to use in Tales of Symphonia, but not have any of them functional. I say that. I don't think they're functional. I can try the sorcerer's ring. I was actually not sure where to go next. Oh, hilarious. Well, never mind. <laughs> Uh, it's a good question. I guess you, you were. Oh, well, you were here on Monday, right? Like a week ago, so you missed just the last two streams, is that right? I mean, I think all things considered, it was a, a good set for you to miss because Dan and I were really taking our time, and on Wednesday we had the pleasure actually of having uh, a new user in chat who was really interested in talking philosophy and religion with us, so we kind of paused for a while and just did that. But yeah, we are still we're hunting the Centurion's cores. Um, of we're looking for the core for the Centurion of Ice. So you know, hold that thought. I'm just gonna I'm gonna try to get her bone and see if that can calm her down, so that I don't lose my mind uh, on on this side of the stream. I'll be right back. Well, if I know my dog, I'm willing to bet that she's just going to go right back. And what she does, if I haven't explained this before on stream, because I know this will be really interesting to all the Twitch viewers, is Gamer's dog loves to play games, right? And so her favorite game is what I call Reverse Fetch, where she will deliberately put her favorite toy, this yellow squeaky bone, which I'm sure all regular viewers are familiar with, uh, either under the couch or some other place where it's out of reach for her. And then she will demand that I get it for her, and that is her favorite game in the world. Um, so that's that's what I was dealing with on my side. Um, yeah, so we're on the hunt for the core of the Centurion of Ice. We figured out that Void had a sense of where it was going to be, and namely that the cores have been showing up uh, at the corresponding places where the, um, the summon spirits of the same element were in the events of the last game. And so we went to Flanor on the way to the Temple of Ice. Uh, we saw that the town had been kind of dem uh, devastated, seemingly by Lloyd. Uh, and he showed up in the town and we kind of confronted him and he didn't really explain anything to anyone. Um, we ran into Sheena, who's now traveling with us. If, uh, if you didn't catch that on the stream, and I'm trying to think of what else. Uh, we did some side questing with Richter, Emil basically like skipping out on Marta to like help Richter amass items that have to do with the Church of Martell and seemingly with his past. So we learned that he's a half elf, if you didn't know that already. And he seems to have kind of some, uh, some tensions that are connected to that in terms of how he thinks about the world and humanity. Um, we discovered that the, uh, the Centurion's Core of Ice was taken by the son of the accessory shop owner in Flanor in Maltokyo, because we were selling to nobles, which was what led us to Maltokyo in pursuit of him. Um, we also ran into the higher-ups from the Vanguard a few times along the way, and in the Temple of Ice... Well, actually, before that in Flanor, but then we confronted him in the Temple of Ice. We met this other uh, guy in the Vanguard who's sort of opposite Alice, a guy named Dex, who is obsessed with Alice, wants to be her paramour, um, wears atrocious cologne, which he thinks gets all the ladies, uh, and is a bit of a shapeshifter. So he lured Marta away in the Temple of Ice to try to get the drop on the party by impersonating her father, who is in the vanguard. Um, trying to think, what else, what else? I think those are the main things. And then if you missed the very top of the stream, so when we were in Meltokyo, Alice 
at least Alice, maybe also Dex. I forget if he was there. Um, they confronted the party when the party was trying to get to the castle to find out what had happened to the Ice Centurion's core. And um, Alice rigged this monster of hers with a bomb. And so in order to protect the party and also the townspeople of Tokyo, Tenebrae took the monster like outside the radius of danger and the monster exploded in the air and destroyed Tenebrae. Uh, and since then, Emil has been in Radicross mode, but he's also been able to explain to us that um, Centurions, when they die, they basically just go back to their core, and so that's why we're at the Temple of Darkness now, because the thought is that uh, we can find Tenebrae's core here at the Temple of Darkness and reconstitute him and bring him back into the party. Uh, I think that's most of the big stuff. But if you have any lingering questions or stuff from the uh, from the last stream that you remember, I'm happy to see if I forgot anything. I also am very lost about what to do next, if, uh, if that's not clear. Oh, okay. There we go. There was exactly one that was not broken. <laughs> of course, it's the last one I check. We got there. Idea where the core is without Tenebrae. Too bad the other Centurions don't talk to us the way the Tenebrae does. Uh, yeah, good question. I think consistent with some of the things that we saw in places like the um, like the new ruins that branched off of the Stone Dais in Asgard, the world is kind of. Like, we're discovering places that are sort of new depths to old areas. So, like, adding in new nuance to familiar places. Like, that happened in the Temple of Ice, where basically there was a new crack in the wall um, on, like, the far side of the dais where Celsius, the Summon Spirit of Ice, appeared. And that led into, like, a whole new area of the cave where the... Um, the Centurion of Isis core was until it was taken. So it's a lot more of that just archaeological element basically of going back to old places, but um, finding finding new places in them that have more to do with the Centurions and that whole layer to the world that we uh, had no reason to know of in the first game. Bunch of useless twits. By the way, Emil, you've been in Ratatosk mode for a while now. Something wrong with that? Not wrong, I mean, you're really. Kind of just... edgy. Maybe too edgy. Shh, be quiet. What is it? I hear voices from inside. It just looks like a normal wall. Maybe the sorcerer's ring will open this one too. Doesn't look like it. There must be a switch somewhere else. All right, on the hunt for. <laughs> speaking of new areas and old familiar places, a new door in the old familiar Damn Temple it. of Darkness. What's with this hidden door crap? When I find it, I'm smashing it to pieces. Emil, humans have a saying: a wise head makes a closed mouth. And what's that supposed to mean? Uh, I'm not sure. Placing the control mechanism for a secret door adjacent to that door would be of little value. This can only mean that the switch is in a remote location. Oh, I see. But you're using that wrong. My apologies. And what's with the impression of Tenebrae anyway? I miss him. Then we'd better stop wasting time and find the real thing. Yeah. Boy, these skit dynamics are very different with Emil in Ratatosk mode versus the typical meek and affable Emil we've come to know and have mixed feelings about.
change their classes, I think, at the end of last stream, so they might still just be a few more levels. That might be one of the last ones. At least make it challenging. Want to check them? Let's find out. Uh, I mean, their levels could be higher, but I don't feel like they should be as classy as they are, if I'm being honest. Uh, oh well, we don't have anything we can do about that right now. No grimoires, so let's just troll with the bunches. Thank goodness we went out of our way and spent a life bottle in order to then get a life bottle. There is indeed a lamp. Can we light it from here? Ah, so we can. Very cool. I don't know if that'll do anything, but maybe? I feel like it's worth a shot. I don't know whether EV squeaking is an improvement or worsened experience relative to her barking and freaking out before. <laughs> or just a lateral move. I think that's the best I can do for now. Tells games so often include these RNG gels, like the lottery gels, but especially when they're so expensive, I just I don't, I don't see how I could talk myself into buying them. I feel like there are too many other more reliable uh, battle supports to invest in. I didn't realize that. Boy, this whole time. Well, at least we learned now. And I definitely want more to have a mystic mark reducing her spellcasting time. Which, of course, I think to do now as opposed to on the stream last week when Dan was controlling her and griping over and over again very reasonably about how long it took for her to cast spells. Oh, sorry, Dan. That's why you have to come back. I'll be able to give you better advice next time. stuff that we need for dessert at this vendor. Man, if only you were a little better stocked, buddy. I 
I guess you want to die. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll be able to keep a pace with the level in some spent twice as long as I probably needed to figure out how to get down that lower level. See, I say that, and I still feel like we're struggling to keep up with where the game wants us to be for levels. I find myself wondering, especially in games like this, when that happens, like, am I gaming the monster system wrong? Like, do they want me to be raising monsters differently than I am? Especially after the first game, I want to just kind of go and, and drive with the characters and it's, it's harder to invest in real monster management as opposed to just throwing ones I like into the party and seeing what happens. not have many skill points to speak of. I'm not sure whether she can use a mystic art when she's not the playable character. But I know that characters in other Tales games can. And they can in Tales of the Abyss, which was before this, so I'm gonna hope that she can. We'll see what happens. That's cool. Our Sphinx friend can slow down enemy casting. That seems pretty sweet. Yeah, geez, maybe the monsters will become a little better now that I actually equip their skills. They must have just unequipped all of them when they changed classes because I know that I had them running like some skills at least first have them in the party. Alright. Oh, we can't go through the, uh, the window like we could in the first game. I thought I saw something there. The, um, the, the machine to change the element that the sorcerer's ring uses. Let's do this! Hmm. Oh, Another big thing you missed, uh, case in point here, is that as the character is getting level 30, we unlock the ability to use their Mystic Arts, which is what this is. This is a meals. Which is very sweet and cinematic and characteristic of the Tales games. Wasn't a big part of Symphonia, although I guess they did add it on hard difficulty, which we weren't playing on to the remaster. See that? But it wasn't to the original to the Symphonia. Fight. Don't watch! Pretty much, uh, I think pretty much from right after that onward, like starting with Tales of the Abyss, those big finisher like, cinematic mystic arts became a big part of the story. Especially in Tales of the Abyss, because teaser for my article, but you will see at one point that um, one of the climactic moments in the game actually revolves around a specific use of a character's mystic art. <laughs> hey, I mean, you are preaching to the choir when it comes to Sisyphean labors of love and working through games, so I feel you, I'm rooting for you. That's a big part of what working through the Tales of the Abyss study was for me, um, but I often find that uh, 
those sorts of efforts that we make, especially when it comes to the games that we love, pay off in ways that we can't even anticipate beforehand. Okay, Heavenly Tempest, that's a new one. Just try it out. I guess you want to die. Oh, that's pretty cool. Ooh, I love the mobility of his eyes. You really get out of the way while it's happening. Amazing. Let's that's true. I, uh, if it helps, I know many people who don't finish games, but that's, um, I don't know if it's an obsessive aspect of my personality or just the way I think about my work or the literature that I consume, but it is very rare for me with stories even more broadly than just gaming to start something and not see it through. Actually, it's funny because I clocked that when Dan was here because uh, Dan's a big horror guy. If you don't know that, you probably know that, Chrissy. But for those who don't know, Dan is a big horror guy. And so we wanted to watch a horror movie one night. And so we were browsing the various streaming services and we ultimately found one uh, that was just very obviously from the first 10 minutes not going to be a good movie. Uh, and Dan turned to me and was like, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we should just dip on this movie. Dip is in, you know, just opt to not watch it and watch something else, you know, if that doesn't translate to British. Um, which we did, and we ended up finding something that was like a much more interesting, if still kind of campy and not, in my opinion, like not super high quality horror movie, but more interesting and higher quality. But if it were just me sitting and watching it, you better believe I would have sat through the uh, very tedious, I think, Amazon original horror movie, which in hindsight probably should have told us everything we needed to know about what we'd be getting from it. But yeah, I don't know. I think for me, it's like, I hope this doesn't come off as a brag. I don't mean it to be, but I feel like after, you know, however many years of just consuming media, I feel like that I have a pretty good beat on what I'm going to enjoy or not, uh, especially when it comes to games, at least in terms of what's worth giving a chance to. And so I think that sort of selection bias is a big part of why I finished what I started, um, just because of the sample of things that I decide to play anyway. I find it to be worth seeing it through. And then beyond that, it's like, it's something we talk about a lot um, on With a Terrible Fate in terms of analyzing games and especially thinking about their quality, right? Like, I think in, in many cases, if not most cases with games and stories, like, for me at least, it's just much more interesting to think about what is trying to be expressed in them and what sort of its unique insight is or what role it puts you as the player in versus just, like, preemptively tearing it down and saying like oh this is not interesting and therefore I'm not going to bother with it yeah that's fair and that's a different issue you're right I'm, uh, I'm talking about a different kind of not finishing a game for sure Is it the kind of thing for you, Chrissy, with Persona 5, where, like, um, trying to think of the right analogy. So for me, right, um, sometimes I have what you might describe as, like, different physical challenges, but something that's like a physical challenge in terms of, like, being able to progress in, like, um, Bloodborne's DLC, right? Like, a Dark Souls-style game with really punishing and hard combat, and if you can't get past, like, a certain boss, you just you can't complete the game, that's too bad. Um, and so for me with that stuff, like, I'll sometimes, you know, recruit, like, a friend or the online community is great for this to do, like, co-op or get that kind of support to basically, like, help me overcome those hurdles which I have difficulty with on my own. Is, is that the kind of thing where, like, you're able to get, um, like, that kind of support or help or is that, like, a different thing that I'm talking about too? I feel like I've lost 
adjust the flow of which parts of the nails I want to combo off of which other ones here. Gotta get back in the game. Oh god, it, you're looking for something to do. You have my sympathy all the same. And I am confident, especially with the uh, just determination and stick to itiveness that you've shown with that over months and what, if not years at this point. That was too easy. Oh, got it. I think I, I, uh, I responded to your other message uh, after the fact, and that's not what you were talking about. Yeah, that's a good point. It is such a different experience when you are uh, when you avail yourself of someone who really knows the game, right? And again, to use this probably imperfect analogy that I'm working with in terms of like Miyazaki games and Dark Souls, that's always a gamble where I feel like I'm rolling the dice, especially if I'm going through a new area in a game like that for the first time, and I get someone to like help or support me or do co-op because one of my least favorite things and like it's time saving and in some ways it's helpful and i know that the person is trying to be helpful but it does color your experience like when someone comes into co-op and they see you're going through the area for the first time and they will just like take it upon themselves to like kill all the enemies and guide you to all the little hidden corners where like the special items or the secrets are and like it, it is nice to have that discovery in one sense of the items, but in another sense, like having them all pointed out to you in sort of this taskmaster mission oriented way sort of can sometimes for me at least take away a lot of the discovery element that's part and parcel to exploring that sort of game. Yeah, I know, guys. That was me. I got my wires first. We're caught up now. We got back in sync. <laughs> and that wasn't even lag. That was just Aaron processing text lag. Real life lag, I guess. But we got there. See that? Yes, I watched all of it. Oh, yeah. I think it's you a lot better for, uh, than before. And I also feel like, I don't know if you're uh, tuning in from a, a different place or network now, um, but remembering some of our conversations in the last few weeks, I feel like there's less lag, um, specifically in conversation with you, than we'd had before. So that seems good. I feel like someone just got a new skill or arch or something. Say your prayers. Oh, it was that our uh, our old can change possible. Wait, I'm not gonna concern myself about it the moment. I like my winged buddies. I will tell you, between me playing this with all its monsters and enjoying Dan's audio series and talking to him about both problems here. I am very jazzed for the Scarlet Mabel is, um, remind me, is that, is that your, uh, parent's dog, cat? Mazel we'll talk to your uh, your parents on the wedding anniversary too. That's great. Well, the other thing you missed, Chrissy, uh, last week, not in terms of game analysis, but in terms of 
me nerding out about gaming things was I got the, um, the Tears of the Kingdom OLED, which I am multiply excited about because A, I'm really hyped for Tears of the Kingdom, as you know, but B, my, uh, the Switch that I had was like the old original model from the 2017 launch, so God, it is, it's more of an upgrade than I expected. It's definitely not just the screen being OLED, but the whole thing runs better, the screen's a little bit bigger, and now because I uh, still have my old Switch, I have two dogs, so got one out in the living room TV, and I've got one in my bedroom for that time game, as we talked about before on the screen. I'm excited to juggle those. There it's Cat, there you go. Well, if she grew to love you, then she's uh definitely uh, definitely your cat too. You know, I always call my uh, my parents cats my cats as well. Actually, although maybe maybe I won't with their most recent ones though, because I am in the weird part of my life now where they just got new cats a couple months ago and it's the first time that they are raising cats when I'm not like actively and frequently in the house. So those don't feel like my cats as much, which is a weird and kind of alienating feeling. I wish that they did. Yeah, you did mention that, um, which makes a lot of sense. I think I had not realized what a, a jump up in quality just the like the V2 model was. It was like, yeah, the battery's better. I can tell it processes things a little more efficiently. Uh, so I'm with it also shout out to like the companies that are doing tempered glass screen protectors because i got one for this new switch and oh my god i remember back in the day applying a screen protector was such a nightmare and i could never do it right and i had all these bubbles on my screen and i always just felt like i was messing up my underlying piece of technology but the one i got for the switch went on like a dream idiot proof like i don't think i could have messed it up if i tried that was a happy ending to that. Yeah, I can imagine that would make a big difference, being in the same city. My folks are on the other side of the country, although I will be back there seeing them this month for my unbelievably 10-year high school reunion, because I'm feeling old. But I was joking while Dan is out here, he will always be turning older than I am in any given year, and this year was his 30th birthday, so that was good for reassuring me that while I'm getting old, I could be getting older. <laughs> Let's change our ogre buddy's class. My god, this guy is strong. Yeah, we stopped using him because he was just, like, he refused to, um, to battle with us. Like, he was just kind of wandering around. This is weird. So, Ogre, I think, was the first one. And for some reason, it won't let us evolve into Titan? Ugh. I'm gonna have to look into that, so I guess I won't evolve him for now. Because we are definitely missing something. I had to guess, based on my limited memory of this game and my better memory of Pokemon, we are probably missing some kind of item that is required for evolution. So they probably crypt that from Pokemon. I think I remember reading some tutorial about that back early on the stream. Yes! Alright, got a shot of That doesn't mean it'll come through, but we have a shot. That was too easy. Oh, he's a demon. Like a 
guess the other one was the Undertaker. You gotta have a demon in your party. Come on. Yes. Oh, that's cool. I'm gonna put that brother in. Maccabees. What a name for a demon. Right, I'll take that werebear out in favor of the demon. Battery life is a big thing, but I'm not sure I totally understand your comment. Is the OLED supposed to have a worse battery than other switches? I hadn't heard that. I think if you haven't been spoiled by an OLED TV, um, there's no reason to upgrade the quality necessarily. Yeah, I will say I haven't really, um, well, two things. I've had an OLED TV for um, maybe four or five years at this point. That doesn't sound right. That sounds like too many years. Four years at least, I would say. And Burnin, thankfully, and knock on wood, has, has not been an issue in the way that everyone warned me it would be. Um, so that's a good silver lining. And then also, again, maybe just because I have the V1 switch, but I feel like the battery life of this OLED switch is in my first few days of it. At least relative to what I'm used to, is, um, I don't know, maybe not a step up, but certainly not a step down. Like, I feel like uh, it's holding its own at least as well as the other version. Maybe even a little better. But they might have improved the battery life. Should have never gone against me. Living sword, please. Ooh. Oh, sorry. I was more excited about the demon, to be honest with you. <laughs> I think people who know me, even from my work, and have uh, seen some of the monsters I've been going after in this game will not be surprised. I think I'm pretty pretty consistent in my taste about the kinds of characters I'd like to play as in JRPG parties and to recruit to join. Yeah, no, I mean, if the V2 was an improvement on the V1 and it wasn't OLED versus this now being the OLED, that would logically stand to reason for me. Because I do think that OLED um, typically uses more battery power. I know um, on the TV side, maybe last year, there was a lot of news that Samsung was working on we won't lose. some kind oh, of next-gen OLED. It might not even be an OLED. Whatever was supposed to be the next big thing in TV is also more energy efficient. You're good. Are you kidding me? You timed these conversations super well. Like there's there's uh, not much story right now. A lot of enemies, not a lot of stuff. But you will recall having watched the first uh, the first game being streamed that we're getting close to what at least was the end of the temple in the original game, so hopefully there will be some more story in a moment here. Also, and this is not to convince you to go out and buy a, a Zelda OLED, but just for the sake of, if you're curious and knowing that you won't get it, um, the, like, the etched designs on it, much higher quality and cooler looking in person than I had expected. I'd kind of been worried it would be like a fairly generic skin, especially given just how many of these special edition OLEDs they seem to be churning out for different franchises. But you could tell they actually put a lot of care into the, not just the design, but also the execution. I felt right in front of my other Zelda edition consoles that I've amassed without even really trying to. Because I don't. I don't see myself as the kind of person who like, intentionally collects special edition consoles, but I got the um, 
the, that was the Twin easy. World's 3DS my freshman year of college. That was like my first big purchase that I bought for myself when I was like out of my parents' house and everything. And then of course, when I was doing all the work on Majora's Mask, I had to go out of my way to get the Majora's Mask new 3DS, which is still one of my uh, my prides and joys in my, my overall gaming collection. And then for the, uh, the two seconds that I used a Wii U back in the day, I got the Wind Waker edition of that console. I don't have them all. I would never make it a life goal to collect all the special edition consoles, but it is nice to have at least a little bit of a theme going on there. Say your prayers. I love that sound. Yeah, and see, I get what you're saying, but also here I am in the U.S. being really jealous of you being able to put hands on the collector's edition at all, because I still have not been able to do that, and I'm kind of at the point of giving up, so... <laughs> Should have never gone against me. I take your point, but I am also envious of you at the moment. I do have the collector's edition of Final Fantasy XVI locked down, so just gotta... Cross your fingers and knock on wood that that's actually good and worth it. Because I have a uh, a penchant for investing in the Deluxe or Collector's Edition of recent Final Fantasy titles only to be disappointed by I them. wonder if Tenebrae's really here. I have the, uh, like, Ultra Collector's whatever of Final Fantasy XIII Lightning Returns, which, as I know we talked about on a previous stream, um, Let's say didn't totally meet my expectations for the conclusion of the series. Actually, that's not the right way to put it, because at that point in the franchise, I did not have especially high expectations of the way in which it would be, um, its conclusion would be consummated. But I still held out hope. I always do for those games. <laughs> yeah, commitment's one word for it. Actually, uh, my British friend, you might appreciate that when I was on the hunt for the Majora's Mask 3DS, and based on what you've said about availability of collector's editions, this will probably not be a surprise to you, I actually ended up having to get one from the UK, because that was the only place I could find them. They were unavailable in the US, which was how I hilariously found out that the new 3DS was region locked, uh, which was fine, because really the only thing I used it for was playing Majora's Mask 3D, which came preloaded onto it, but yeah, even in um, in English-speaking regions, you can't play like games released in the U.S. on a British console, and vice versa, presumably. Don't worry, oh, Nintendo. The other Centurions told us that Tenebrae would be here. I'm sure he is. Okay. Relax. I can sense his presence. Really? Yes, trust me. I'm your guardian, the Knight of Ratatosk. Oh, what an unexpectedly heartfelt thing for Ratatosk mode Emil to say. Yeah. Emil, you sure say some manly things when you're in Ratatosk mode. Well, you guys have been bullying me about being a man for like 20 hours, so. Shut up! Oh, not a knight of Ratatosk, but a knight of Marta. It's cute. I will say for those who um, are watching the stream and also have read or are planning to read my article that I just published on Tilt of the Abyss, really good point counterpoint if you want to compare and contrast different love stories in Tales of the Abyss. Wow, well, excuse me, in games in Namco's Tales series, uh, because I think so many other things are happening in the typical JRPG that we don't always foreground or think about the romantic aspect of it, um, especially in the Tales series, but I think looking at the romance in this Dawn of the New World versus something like Tales of the Abyss to say nothing of something more recent like Tales of the Arise. Wow, Tales of Arise. Excuse me, all these uh, definite articles. It's because Tales of the Abyss is so close to Tales of Arise, but one has the definite article and one doesn't. 
Anyway, those are all definitely games that feature certain kinds of romances, but they are all distinctive in really interesting and subtle ways that I think um, propagate outward to give the overall story very different aesthetics and, and feelings which is one of the reasons that I wanted to do Tales of Praxis and look at the series as a whole because you really don't you appreciate die. those little flourishes and differences unless you're, you have them all kind of in your kind of access memory, so to speak. Yes, thank you. Region, region locking is always silly and needless, even from the company perspective. Maybe even especially from the company perspective. Very silly. That was too easy. And adding to the like hilarious insanity of it, so I got the the 3DS from the UK, right? And then because I was on the hunt to amass all of the different pre-order incentives uh, that they had in a million different places, because I really wanted to, you know, kind of honor and remember my time spent studying Majora's Mask, I also bought the game that I've literally never opened codenamed Steam because that, of all things, uh, had its sales pushed by having as an add-on the um, like the special collector's edition pin of Majora's Mask, which I still wear all the time at the conventions and conferences to this day, basically whenever I'm talking about video games. But if I remember correctly, uh, that version of codenamed Steam that I got was a US version and so I couldn't even play if I wanted to the game that I got for the Majora's Mask pin on the Majora's Mask console because they're two different English-speaking regions <laughs> that are never supposed to interact with each other apparently according to Nintendo so yeah thanks Nintendo thanks so much Oof. That's a real drive back to these little swords. Jesus. Oh, you mean the, the throwaway reference to the game that I bought to get the Majora's Mask pin? It's a game called Codename Steam. And I couldn't tell you anything about it, except that it was a game for the new 3DS, or the old 3DS, uh, and it was the unique place where you were able to get, through pre-order, the, um, the, like, metal Majora's Mask pin, which, like, if you watch me lecture at packs or places like that, I, I basically always wear it. So it was definitely worth the price of the game for me, but... Yeah, I bought the game solely to get that thing as part of my time spent with the Jerry's Mask. It's an acronym, I think. Here, I'll, I'll type the name while uh, Neil's doing his thing. This is the final strike! Yeah, I literally just bought the game to get the pin. But honestly, I've done more for less. Oh, do it again. It's the uh, the pride and joy of my At least make it challenging. Usually, when I go to cons, I will uh, I'll always wear pins because that's definitely the vibe that you want. And one will always be the Majora's Mask pin because you know, homage to the origins of with a terrible fate as an intellectual enterprise and publication. And then one I'll. I'll swap in or out depending on what we're talking about or what game I'm playing. So, like for PAX East a couple months ago, I had the Majora's Mask pin and then a pen of Kratos from Tales of Symphonia, which I got, um, I think as part of a Tales soundtrack that I picked up in Japan when I visited Dan years back while he was living there. You thought what was interesting. Um, Codename Steam? I mean, it might be. I, I, I never played it. Um, but it's in my library, and so if you think it's worth putting on my list, I definitely will. Uh, this is not a save point that heals. I was thinking it was. So are we going to get another one, or 
should we heal the party? I'll, I'll just preemptively heal the party. I don't fully trust where this game places its heal saves. That makes me feel safer. Ah, I appreciate you bringing it up again. Um, no word other than the idea of an enamel pin based on the symbol has very much been on my mind since you mentioned that. So especially now that this seemingly never ending Tales of the Abyss analysis is off my plate and out in the world, I'm going to start thinking about other kind of site wide initiatives to work on. And that is high on my list. So I appreciate you bringing it up again. Just means you gotta make sure that you buy one once, uh, once it does come into being. <laughs> I know I will. I don't know. This is where we found Shadow, the summoned spirit of darkness, two years ago. But this wasn't here yeah, then. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that about the uh, the site's logo. I was really proud of that too. I think it um, still to this day kind of captures the heart of what we're about in terms of melding, as you say, the um, sort of the philosophical discipline and serious analysis while also capturing the spirit of the passion that gamers have for these games and studying them in a way that is meaningful and material to the actual gamer as opposed to just the academic who stays in the ivory tower and doesn't really engage with the substance of why we love these games so much maybe it's some sort of switch well that, i mean that's got to be the uh, the hidden door on the way up at the top, right? <laughs> oh, damn. And here I was thinking I would set the price point at $100 US. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I guess you want to die. Wow, well, especially for the fan swag, are you kidding me? As we do work on rolling that out, which I really would like to do. There's a lot of people like you who are sufficient fans that you would want to do and stuff like that. We want to make a point to make it as accessible as possible for you. I will keep you posted, yes, especially with the pen. I will I'll guarantee that you'll be the first to know because truly you're the reason I'm thinking about a specific one right now. Should have never gone against me. Next attack two. I think that adds another hit to his combo. Something good. What you got for us? Too many menus. I can remember. Oh no, it's so much more specific than that. Okay, so... It's like a charged attack equivalent. And we have one now in the ground and on the air. Okay. In the ground and on the air. Wow. On the ground and in the air. Our positions. Not my friend this stream. You know why? I joke about this with Dan all the time. It happens after presentations, too. Um, I like spend all of my grammar and word points in getting something together for publication and then once I actually breathe it out into the world and release it it's like my whole brain just wants to shut off and take a, a 72 hour break so I didn't want to cancel the stream because I have truly been enjoying this so much as well and I think it is a very different speed of gaming and mode of engagement than something like a long written analysis but it seems as if I'm having better spring words together. It's because I spent all of my mood action points over the weekend getting the final draft of a uh, Kabbalistic study of Tales of the Abyss. To At least make it challenging.
I'll put it in chat, actually, as I'm thinking of it. I know I said that the article was on with the Terrible Fates homepage. And it is, but listen, I'm new to streaming, and I just over the past couple streams have broached the, uh, the posting in the chat for the first time, so I'm going to abuse that feature. If you want to check out the, uh, the article on Tales of the Abyss, I'm going to drop the link right in the chat, and I'd love to hear what you think. Tweet at me. Tweet at the site. Comment on our stream. third hand so that I can do that posting while also continuing I to guess play you want to die. supposed to be in the air when it's something it's like a bad it's like a rose petals or something. It's not totally what I'd otherwise associate with it. Although I guess part of the Knight of Radatos card is the scarf which is kind of ornamental and elegant. See that? Yes! So I watched all of it! You fight! Them. Don't watch! I like his current sword that we have equipped. And it has um, nice complementary aesthetics with Marta's spinners. I guess you want to die. Impart a portion of that power. I think I missed somewhat efficiently. I really wish I had thought of that back when Dan was here. I will say I've been thinking a little because I'm always thinking at least one step ahead right, of what to stream after this in terms of the Tales of Praxis series because I might stream other stuff too but I want to continue playing through the Tales games with you all uh, and I wasn't sure whether to play something that I had already played, such as these, or one that I had never played, and I'm still open to, to people's feedback if people feel strongly about trying one versus the other, but playing through the uh, the DLC for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, I find myself thinking that it would be really hard for me with the way that I think about games to play through a game for the first time on stream, because I feel like so much of it is just me like wandering around the world and not saying much and just kind of letting it all sink in and absorbing it. And I don't know, maybe that would be fun for people, but I feel like a lot of the stream is I at least enjoy it when it's like conversational and a little bit of like performative. Um, and it's just like Totally different mode. Either when I'm playing something new or maybe just when I'm playing Xenoblade. It might also be a Xenoblade thing for me at this point. Golden Sun! Oh! Man, you know how to campaign for things, Chrissy. <laughs> yeah, I, I... I mean, I'm re I, I love these projects of kind of like, not even binging, but just getting comprehensive looks at series that I think reward playing or studying the various entries one right after the other so I think I want to keep doing this either way but one thing that I am thinking about is like maybe layering in another stream on top of it of a different game because right now I only stream three times a week and I could I definitely do more than that if people were interested um so yeah maybe something like a golden sun I was thinking about maybe trying to do like a genre break just to make it accessible to other people who might it's not open. be big on JRPGs too I will also tell you, because I think you were the one who's mentioned it more than once, right? But tell me if I'm conflating things. I, I um, 
I had Eternal Sonata in my head because it's been mentioned so many times on the stream and, and even just in my gaming conversations beyond it. And so while Dan was here, we were walking Eevee and I asked him, hey, did you ever play this game, Eternal Sonata? And he was just like, without missing a beat, yes, you should play that. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's definitely one that's still on my mind as well. Oh, that's hilarious. You literally mentioned Eternal Sonata as I was bringing it up. <laughs> so, so yeah, it was you who mentioned it before, I'm going to guess. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if it has to be awkward over the internet. We, uh, Looks like that switch we found we was seem to, to be making wall. a collaborative playing of, of um, the Tales series work. Unless you're meaning, like, literal co-op, in which case, yes, I can imagine that would be hard over the internet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Your, your comment was going through the tubes as I was talking. I wonder if Tenebrae's up ahead. Probably. Though I'm sure we'll find some enemies waiting for us as well. You mean the voices we heard earlier? The only people with any business in a place like this would be Lloyd or the Vanguard. We can't let them take Tenebrae! Let's go! Uh, I see. I do love a good co-op JRPG. Even, um, like doing that little bit of Tales of Symphonia with my friend Araceli and doing some bits of this with Dan. Got the taste for it back in my mouth because I felt like I hadn't done that in so long. It's such a lost art. I know we've talked about that on the stream before, but it so saddens me that the genre as a whole, just because gaming as a whole, is, is moving away from that kind of couch co-op vibe for story games. There is something just so special um, about it that you don't get anywhere else. Well, Dan and I are actively thinking about other ways to do stuff like this, so... That could be a way for you to go up on days. I'll have to bring that up with him. I actually didn't I uh, didn't know when I asked him about it this past week that it was co op. Otherwise I would have mentioned it but now he's still here. Yeah, we have uh, kind of quietly begun scheming to maybe eventually live much closer to each other in the next few years, in which case you gotta believe there'd be an explosion of that kind of content. Whether you like it or not. Shut up! That was nothing! I love the way you said that! Sick, that's a series anymore. that, for everything everyone says about it, I've never been able to get into. But that one I understand, that's just because I have a, a very hard time with that kind of game. RTS, is that what people call it? I think that's the right term. Because I know people, um, many of the people with whom I oftentimes discuss gaming, who are really into stuff like that, or Europa Universalis, um, things of that strike. I'm not, I'm not going to be the guy who says and argues that there's no storytelling in this game because I think that's just wrong. Uh, but I think it's one of the stories that I am inclined to pursue through games. It's very much uh, in a different mode than what I typically do. You were more scary. What did you say? Mm, I see. Oh, well, I don't. You, you cast it as turn based and cerebral. I mean, those things are definitely speaking my language, so. Maybe I should give it a chance. I'm sure you probably uh, remember this from the presence of some of the screen, but it's a difficult to loop on the conversation we're having before this whole new world. Uh, well, to crib the phrase from the new world, the dark descent that we're now doing in this, uh, in this temple of darkness is new. You're too weak! Presumably, based on the contours of the world's fiction, were to understand or assume that this area was still there in the uh, Temple of Shadow in Tales of Symphonia. It's not as if it's been constructed in the time since then, but 
It never came up, and the party had no reason to explore it. So it's old yet new, as a lot of things in this game are. Good, okay, that was a full heal one. Ooh, talk about building suspense. I sense... I sense Aqua. Oh, that ain't good. Richter! Richter, I just want to be your friend. We went so on adventures together, man. was Tenebrae returning to core form. How convenient. If we destroy him here... Not so fast! Emil! You're not taking Tenebrae! You got stuck on... Or are you Someone talking about it? Is it the Dark Descent? Is that the game you're talking about? You seem pretty sure of yourself. Just accept the fact you were beaten. <laughs> yes, you're right. If we haven't talked about it before, you haven't seen my work on it. I have nothing but love for the Amnesia games. Um, Rebirth, especially. I think I Rebirth is you. criminally underrated. So. Because I can't wait to kill you. Yeah, I can't recommend them enough, and I could not be more excited for Bunker. We'll get that in a few months. Oh, we have to fight Richter. Oh, and after all of the buddy cop side quests we did Come with him too. Are you ready? Oh no! Oh, he has a mystic art too. It's not just us, you guys. Right off the bat, too. He didn't give us time to think. Oh, I appreciate that. I'm glad I could do it for you. I will say I think that the Dark Descent is the most, like, conventionally scary of them. You might be more scared by Machine for Pigs, depending on, you know, what your personal proclivities are. But I think in terms of, like, standard horror, that would freak people out. Dark Descent was definitely the, uh... Okay. Oh, hell, he's he's the very... Dark you better not be Oh, Jesus. That wasn't good. Oh, were we supposed to lose that? Yeah, as I looked, we weren't actually doing damage to him. Well, that makes me feel a little better. And not that I was just woefully underleveled. I'm so power. Oh no. That art is. Everything's connected, guys. I'll have to tell you after this cutscene. Guess you're tougher than I thought. Looks like I'll just have to hit you with another one. Emil, you're. I, I just can't believe it. Victor seems to be having a realization. <laughs> I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Emil, listen to me. You must cease being a knight of Ratatosk. If you won't, then I'll. then I'll have to. Quit your pointless whining! Die! Wait, Emil. Calm down. Return back to normal. You're destroying the whole temple. Shut up! Get out of my way! I'm so our! Eternal recurrence! Oh no. What? We have Jewish mysticism and Nietzsche. In, in one battle exchange. Oh no. Marta. Marta! Uh, 
where am I? So, <laughs> this is hilarious. Uh, and, you know, it just goes to show there are no coincidences and everything in the cosmos is ordained mostly for comedic effect. Um, as I've said, I published this big treatment on Tales of the Abyss and Kabbalah this morning. Uh, and Tales of the Abyss, for those who don't know or haven't played it, is very self-consciously concerned with Kabbalah. It's not something you have to read into it. Like Many of its towns are actually named after particular like wellsprings of mystic energy from the Jewish mystic tradition of Kabbalah and things like this. Anyway, so I published that this morning. So it's all fresh in my head. So I can tell you when Emil shouts Ein Sof Auer, don't know what Auer means, but the Ein Sof is the, um, the Hebrew term that's used in Kabbalah for um, basically the primordial divinity uh, from which all of creation and the spiritual worlds spring. So it's that kind of, I, I think it literally means something like unending or without limit but it's that like conceptual metaphysical thing that is even prior to god uh and from which everything emanates so i, I i'm not going to speculate about what that has to do with tales of symphonia dawn of the new world right off the bat but i am going to tell you that i feel like bandai namco is trolling me and then eternal recurrence uh if if you're not familiar with your Nietzsche, it's not as fresh in my mind because I didn't literally just publish something on it, but Eternal Recurrence is a stock standard term uh, in Nietzsche's parlance in terms of like the like infinite existential cycles that we go through um, as people, especially in the modern world, uh, as we try to make meaning out of ourselves in society. So we have a pretty thinly veiled battle between Jewish mysticism and Nietzschean uh, existentialism, if you would call it that, uh, in a, a single combat exchange between Emil and Richter. Uh, this is why it's fun to replay these games. I never would have remembered that antecedently, uh, but talk about timing. Marta? Marta, where are you? Where did she go? Tenebrae's core must have fallen with me. Ah, now Emil can channel darkness into an arm. Interesting that he couldn't do that before. Maybe he can only acquire that ability with the cores of centurions that aren't awakened for some reason. Yo, this is why literally everyone should give games a chance. And everyone is over time, but I mean, that was one of the reasons that I was happy to spend so much time in my academic days, like talking the older academics into seeing games as something that was not Pac-Man, but actually did really interesting things in terms of just their literary and philosophical content because once people get it if they're open-minded and appreciate those things in other forms of literature it's not as hard i would say as one might think to get them on board and really excited and engaged with that stuff um, but it is definitely a learning curve especially when you're talking to people who have never had like direct experience with those games but who knows, maybe stuff like streaming could be helpful with that, as that continues to become sort of a, a medium in itself. Yeah, and that sucks, right? Um, and I think really the only thing to help with that is sort of just exposure to the sophistication of them, right? Which is dumb, because I think that, you know, we as gamers and gaming as a medium is such that we should and in many ways are past the point of convincing other people of their sophistication but oftentimes for a lot of people it's just like figuring out what their one button is in terms of their like academic or philosophical concern and then just finding like the exact perfect game to show them like a study of that 
And that, in many cases, I think can be more useful than you know, giving them a survey of look at all the cool things that games have done over the years and the history of their development and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. That's why I think I, I've kind of had more personal success with like presentations and talking people through it. But I think like there is something to the immediacy and magic of like watching someone play a game if you're not going to be willing to play one yourself or like that's kind of the closest you can get um but you're right it's hard to like capture that magic of the lived experience in a way that is digestibly short form that's why you guys just say hey look you know you're my supervisor i want you to get this let's just sit down and we're going to play some of the game together whether that's like you know a few hours of a jrpg or if you find a game that's shorter uh, and therefore more short form just in terms of the length of its playthrough like it requires effort but if you can get someone to commit to that kind of sit down i think that can do a do a lot of work i need to find mart and have her hatch showing rather fast. than telling so to speak that was not as long a skit as i was expecting It's only Marta can hatch the cores, not Emil. I forget whether we knew that already. Marta, you're okay. Emil. Oof. Does it hurt? Is she okay though? I treated myself. I'm okay. It's my fault. I never meant for you to get hurt. It's okay. But what's happening to you? Oh, a lot of stuff. Sheena mentioned it too. You've been in Ratatosk mode for a long time. So you're on their side. Huh? Sheena and Richter are both on my case to return to the normal me. And now you too! No, I didn't say... Why? Why should I? My normal self is a pathetic weakling. A cowardly dog who'll never amount to anything. Emil! You said you wanted me to protect you. As a knight of Ratatosk. And that's exactly what I'm doing. So what's the problem? Emil, I didn't mean it like that. Maybe I should just disappear. None of you want me around. Whoa, that seems like a bridge too far, buddy. Emil! Emil, wake up! I'm gonna bet that's the last we see of Ratatosk mode for a minute. It does strike me that his assessment is right that Marta in particular has been sending him uh, where am I? some somewhat mixed messages over the course of the journey so far in terms of the relationship and what she expects of him. Yep, normal Emil is back. Emil, you're finally back. Back? Are you okay? Sheena! Sheena, you're okay too. Yes, I'm glad both you and Marta are safe, but... But... Tenebrae won't wake up. Tenebrae? So Richter didn't get him after all. What are you talking about? You grabbed the core yourself. Huh? I guess I did. Hmm. And it seems Look, like he's losing time I've been now. trying the same thing I always do to hatch centurions, but Tenebrae won't wake Which up. Which I don't think is something that's happened in the past when he's gone right at Tusk mode. Although I guess maybe it just hasn't been addressed one way or another because he didn't have as extended a period of time in right at Tusk mode previously. Whoa! Wh what was that? Hmm. Tenebrae? So that time, Emil looked like he was the key to waking him up. Whereas with the other ones, it was Emil, Marta rather than Lady Marta, my most humble apologies for worrying you so. Tenebrae, are you okay? Centurions do not die. They only regress to their core state. Though I would not have been able to awaken had you two not come for me. Tenebrae, you sacrificed yourself for me. I'm sorry. Please. Think nothing of it. Thank goodness. I can't stand saying goodbye to friends. Oh, and if you've played the first game, that carries so much weight. Though we have to remember we did ultimately get Corinne back after a fashion with the birth of Varius, so... 
That was a happy ending. Tenebrae! All right, should we start heading back to Mel Tokyo? Regal must be worried by now. So we're just not going to talk about any of that crazy shit that went down with Richter? Right. Oh, uh, wait. Um, what about Richter? Any idea what happened to him? I was caught up in the cave-in, so I can't say exactly for sure. But it looked like that Centurion Aqua rescued him before he was crushed. <laughs> yeah, your wits end, huh, Chrissy? Then he's still alive. Uh, y yeah, probably. Good. The Ratatosk mode you and the normal you are like night and day. We have to remember Sheena is also a vet at the, uh, the JRPG journey, so she is adept at moving the plot along when it's better to focus on moving forward rather than dwelling on the insanity that just happened. It's a time for action and a time for reflection, right? Too. Tenebrae, welcome back. We really missed you. Oh my. Well, I am sorry for causing concern. Is that all you gotta say? Show some emotion. Is old age making us a little wumpy? How rude. I would ask that you not treat me like an elderly dimwit. Look, he's getting angry. It's really him. Yep, I wouldn't have him any other way. What, what happened while I was gone? Honestly, I think it would have been funnier to have a skit where they are like treating him as a baby as opposed to a doddering old man since he was just technically reborn from his core. That's weird. When did I pick up Tenebrae's core? Is something wrong, Emil? Well, yeah. My memory is... Your memory? No, it's okay. It's nothing. My memory of... Don't worry about it. The Temple of Darkness is really hazy. Why? I'm sure it won't come up again. I also definitely feel we haven't had this conversation in a minute, but I think Tenebrae knows you. more than he is I'm letting sorry. on about this stuff. Just sort of came out. I guess it <laughs> he called so Sheena mom. Like, you think I'm motherly? <laughs> Are you implying that I'm old? Uh, no, kind of like that. I mean, you were really kind and grown up and stuff, and I don't know, kind of like the middle-aged women who lived in my Jesus Christ! Uh, hey, Tenebrae, help me out here. You see, on some level. Emil feels a sort of attachment toward you as a mother. And as we know, a powerful symbol of motherhood is the breast. <laughs> the young man is simply expressing his appreciation for your ample bosom. Jesus huh? fucking Christ. Is that how you've been looking at me? You, you creep! You jerk! You perv! How could you? I hate you! <laughs> I guess reawakening didn't change. So, it, okay, for keeping score, we have Jewish mysticism and Nietzsche and Freud. <laughs> I guess we already had Nietzsche, so Freud is implied. But now we have explicit Freud. Oh, explicit Freud. He's a band I was to. At least make it challenging. Did we get the safe point? Back to the, uh, the other bottom of the temple. Of the so it is kind of interesting whether it comes up or not that despite Radicals mode reveals resignation, that, well, maybe you guys don't want me around, so I'll go away. He does still come out in battle. It's not as if he's totally gone to wall on us. We still have some some of that dynamism between their characters. I 
was almost expecting to go back to battle with the uh, little one combat in the old who can barely hold a sword. I don't even remember him from the first like, 45 minutes of the game. That was fun. sufficiently small set of overall arts where you can set all of the arts they have available to a different button combination where you don't have to pick and choose between the arts. I feel like once you have to um, make cuts in terms of what you're not able to call out in battle, you just get much more disoriented about their overall art set. Especially with the stream, I still find it hard to you know, pause and, and reflect on and update the Palettes, as opposed to just rolling with what we already have. Alright. Give me more items, please. Thank you so much. Are we going quest now? No. That's right. This one is irrespective of Tenebrae's presence. Try this again. I'm worried we're uh, still not going to be able to get into a Titan. Yeah, I'll have to just look it up afterwards. It's so frustrating. Come on, don't give in to the spoilers and the cooking. That's like the worst of both worlds. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I will say, actually, um, this is not like a reversal of my views on cooking in games, but while Dan was here, uh, he was playing some Breath of the Wild to get himself just back in the swing of things for Tears of the Kingdom, which I also need to do. Probably, what, five years since I played that, at least? Um, but I, I was surprised at how charming I found the cooking mechanics. I think uh, as, as far as cooking in games goes, they did do a pretty cool job of making it fairly naturalistic and unobtrusive. So I'm willing to admit I was maybe being a little harsh on it before. Good for you. I do feel like um, 
mean, I don't follow a lot of the people or, or sites that would be spoiling it anyways, but among those I do follow, I feel like the community has been more decent than I might have feared about sort of avoiding the spoiled content and all the leaks and stuff like that, which has been nice. I remember back when um, Kingdom Hearts got leaked before the third one came out, uh, the fan community came together in a very similar way and was like, we're not going to you know, talk about this or spread it. It's nice when fan communities have a kind of fiber to their uh, integrity. You're all right. What about Tenebrae? As you can see, I am quite well. Terribly sorry to have worried you. So, Regal, did you talk to His Majesty about Glaucius's core? Actually, there's been a bit of progress on that front, which is why I came to find you. Progress? You mean, you know who has the core? That's correct. It's one of Maltokio's nobles, just as we suspected. So who? Hopefully someone who will fork it over without too much trouble. I don't believe it should pose much of a problem. Zellos? The buyer was one Celis Oh, uh, next best thing is sister. Celis? You mean that idiot Chosen sister? The Chosen Zelos's sister. Indeed. We should head to Zelos's mansion. Does that sound good to you two? Of course. I'm not exactly enthusiastic, but it's not like we have a choice. I'm not too eager myself, but let's go. I don't have any enthusiasm. My Ratatosk mode version took that when he left in a huff. That's very cool. Sorry, it, it took me like three times reading that to, to understand the relationship between Breath of the Wild and a Wii U because I, I forgot that it was on the Wii U also. Boy, that makes it feel dated in my mind. Um, before that, I hadn't really thought it was that old. Yeah, I think the um, the special sense of discovery is, is hard to replicate. I mean, that's part of what I was thinking about even with um, this article I want to write about my experience with Regal on the Tales of Symphonia stream. Yeah, I mean, that's why, honestly, um, I forget if we've talked about this before, Chrissy, but the of I really, really avoid dark. even is, trailers for all, things that I know I'm going to play, because it just, especially that's when it's right, an interactive medium like mental. games, darkness right, is quite your different. expectations the world are so central blanket. to, like, how you it guide your actions and the decisions you make in the game, even if it's for relatively minor things, and so... I, I can't imagine a world in which Bruce's you learn a bunch about the game beforehand and it doesn't inform the way you play it right? and how you engage yes, with that world. I suppose uh, that just, describes it well enough. Uh, I understand so that in this day and age of you know, spoiler culture and hype culture, a lot of Indeed. games are designed sort of to accommodate that and to play with they people's expectations the based on the trailers, but I'm just, I'm not there for that. I want to, like you said, go in blind and just explore things for the first time through the fictional world itself rather some than the advertisement too for it. subtle for we humans to perceive <laughs> all right I wasn't sure I think there might be some new side quests that have opened up to us now short scenes as opposed to long long side quest adventures yes we're gonna check in Asgard next to see if there's a scene we can get. Um, so who is Celis? Celis is the half-sister of Zelos, the Chosen. She has a frail constitution. Without the aid of an X-Sphere, yeah, even just everyday adds activities dimension are difficult to it, for her. X-Spheres. Those stones with mysterious powers, right? And they were made by the designs. Yes. They allow people to amp their abilities to their full potential. Both of us have one. The king has issued an order demanding the surrender of all X-Spheres. So we'll have to return these as well someday. At any rate, Celis didn't waste any time in giving her X-Sphere back. And that's why Zelos has been so worried about her. Mm -hmm. When Celis is involved, the Chosen has a tendency to lose his composure. Anyone so much as touches a hair on her head and he'd hunt them down to the gates of hell itself. Wow, that's so dashing. I wish I had an older brother like that. So it's cool that we're getting more insight into sort of the history of X-Spheres in the last two years of the world since its reunification. So I guess not only Lloyd had been 
collecting them, but even the King of Tefeallo is issuing a recall on them, I guess you could say. So those who were in the know about them, I guess, uh, really coalesced around a, a moral stance of taking them out of circulation. That's cool. For having to run halfway across the world, I really hope we've unlocked this little side scene. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a venture somewhat in vain. I guess it's always nice to go back and see an old place, even if there's not something there. <laughs> is open to us now. I think it's on the right hand side of town. Awesome! Sometimes a plan comes together. how many of the scenes are voiced versus Tales of Symphonia uh, now that we're having a scene that isn't voiced and it feels so rare comparatively. Jesus, this is uncomfortable. just Tefeala nobles like preying on Silveranti women and bringing them into the service of their houses. Uh, I think that's exactly what it is. Jesus. It is not... In a game that literally has human ranches, you don't want to say this is as bad as human ranches, but it's still pretty horrid to see something like this in a world that overcame something as monstrous as human ranches. Me too, Marta. Me too. Yeah, well, it's yeah, it's interesting you say that, Chrissy, because it's kind of um, it's like an interesting planned dissonance in our perspective experiencing the narrative, right? Because in that first game, Silverant is very much the declining world, so it makes sense that it's like impoverished and subordinate relative to Tefeala, but because it's the world through which we're introduced to the story and where our first characters and heroes come from. And even really the main character, because I think most people would say, what is the main character? We sort of are more attached to that world as the one that ought to succeed versus Tefeala as the world that's subordinate, not in terms of its mana flow, but in terms of its like literal order in the story and narrative, right? So I think this kind of sequel and uh, meshing of the two cultures is a really good way of forcing those two discordant elements of our experience in the first game into conversation with each other.
Farley steps up. It's interesting the little windows we get into his character, given how minor a character he is. And more so than Aisha, in my mind anyway. Ooh, Ratatosk mode. That's interesting. I get this is a side quest, but it feels a little discontinuous for him to come out now when he just resigned himself and kind of shut off in the, the climax of the events in the Temple of Shadow. Yeah, that's right, Chrissy. But I think the point still stands, right? As I was saying, yeah, because Silveron was the world that was in decline. But I think we had... Um, like we almost ironically had a prioritized attachment to it because it's the world we started out in and it's where sort of the core heroes of the game are from, more or less. Uh, so I think the point still stands. But yes, it was technically in terms of the, like the hourglass balance between the worlds, the one that was um, lacking the mana, which is why Colette was going on the journey at the start of the game. Which is why the Tate Islands, um, like, think they're superior because their society is more advanced. Not just in terms of tech, but as we've seen in terms of, like, just the, the monarchical structure of society and having sort of a more centralized government than Silverant had. No, you're good. Like I said, I think um, I think the heart of what you're saying still totally stands. I'm sorry you haven't been sleeping well. That's never fun. I hate when I can't count on good sleep. It totally changes my perspective on the world. <laughs> Speaking of perspectives on worlds, I guess. It's one banana, Michael. How much can it cost? $10? Oh, isn't that the question? One that would be right at home in the first game and, uh, and really resonates with everything that people are living with in the aftermath of the world reunification too. Well, that was brutal to watch. And it's also really interesting as side content because I think without explicating it, it does a lot to help us understand what's going on with the Vanguard and like the Silveranti Liberation Front too, because you're brought into the game, right? And you're trying to find your footing in terms of, oh, how have these two worlds melded and how are they getting along with each other? And the introduction just drops this idea that Silverantis are being persecuted to the extent that they have this kind of like extremist militant faction trying to assert their place in the world. And it's easy for that to seem very extremist and kind of unfounded even knowing what we know about the relationship between Tefeyala and Silveron but then to like see that much more visceral and human experience of like okay boots on the ground this is how Tefeyalans especially those who are on the more advanced end of society are treating the Silveranti it's not hard to imagine that boiling over into the indignation of Silveranti and then standing up for themselves in aggressive ways as Emil did when he went into ride a tusk mode and presumably as a lot of the Silverante did when they formed the Vanguard. Short memories is right, Chrissy. Nail on the head. Short memories and just like also memories that have failed to integrate, right? Like 
I think we have the benefit of having seen both of these worlds on the whole picture of all of the forces of persecution and misunderstandings that were at play, even from the time of the Carlon War and Ethos onto the, um, like the era of Lloyd and the journey of world reunification and everything like that. But so many of these characters, despite now living in a world that ought to provide a better place, you know, they didn't see all those perspectives. They were much more limited. And so they're kind of being thrust into and forced to reenact a lot of those same traumas that we've already sadly seen play out on all sorts of different scales um, throughout not just one world, but two, really three, if you think about Darius Carlin. Alright, I think there is a follow-up scene to that one if we want to get even more bummed. Uh, Inicelia. Alright. Back to Acelia. Ooh, looks like the table has turned on these nobles now. Um, much narrative continuity in future tales titles. I would say yes, and in some very cool ways. There are some that are like this, more or less direct sequels of one another. So the one that I think we've talked about in the past, Tales of Zillia, it is a direct sequel, Tales of Zillia 2, uh, both of which are on my list to play at some point. Those are ones that I never made it all the way through back in the day. But then they also do cool, less direct sorts of narrative continuity. For instance, might have mentioned this in the past, but there was this standalone game, Tales of Zisteria, for the PS4, I think, that was very much grounded in, um, like, Arthurian mythology, so like um, Lady of the Lake, Sword of the Stone, things like that. Sort of in the stone, not Sword of the Stone. Uh, and then the next game that they did after that, Tales of Berseria, was not on the face of it obviously related to Tales of Zisteria at all, but you go through the game and you kind of discover through playing it that you're basically living out a prequel to Tales of Zisteria and sort of setting up the world to become what it is at the start of that game so it's kind of that interesting like reverse or revealed continuity and then um dan and i were chatting a little bit about this without spoilers on the the streams last week in terms of tales of arise because that doesn't have that sort of obvious direct like historical continuity with other games but it does interesting things in sort of um in terms of like using side quest and post game content to like introduce sort of godlike figures or explanations of ways in which like the different worlds could be treated as different dimensions that are united or dialogue with each other in different ways. And you get that in some of the other titles too, where there are like sort of crossover moments where characters from the other games will show up and it's not like not part and parcel of the events of the plot, but it's sort of like a side mission or post-game content where there's you know some explanation or another of a interdimensional riff or that kind of narratively grounded crossover uh, in order to port the characters there so you get a lot of that interplay as well but yeah i would say in terms of the way that the titles play with and dialogue with each other especially some of those more directed ones like Zisteria and Bruceria, um they do some really thoughtful and unusual things that you don't get in a lot of other um, narratively contiguous game stories.
Well, it's interesting too, Chrissy. You were talking about um, uh, ethnocentrism, right? Or centricity. I'm not sure which way that uh, that noun goes, but something that's interesting to me too in just the dynamics of the way this is represented is uh, like if you look at the name tags for the different people in the scene they don't even have names right they're just identified as like villager versus noble and I think that's a really interesting way of the game capturing sort of the fact that this is more about like class or rank uh, than individuals as well and how that almost like washes their individual identities away in a way that, again, is very consistent with the themes of the first game, right? Um, and harkens back to that horrible um, future that Mythos desired of the age of lifeless beings, which really, I, uh, almost playing through it again now in this most recent playthrough, I almost wish they dove even more into that. Although I feel like, as we're talking about here, part of the magic of it is they don't need to dive more into it because it sounds so abstract and horrible, but it's really just a name for the kind of persecution uh, and failure to see each other that we, we see manifest throughout all of Tales of Symphonia and its sequel. No, I'm just a guy who's trying to be a decent human being with an ethos. Yeah, and I love a JRPG that can do that, and I love that term you use, latent horror, Chrissy, because, you know, I don't think we oftentimes think of the standard JRPG as something that can be evocative of the horror genre, especially because modern gaming has horror as something that is such distinct a game type to something like a JRPG. But you're right, I think just in terms of the themes and the subtlety with which they handle their... Um, their individual and uh, societal conflicts. There's really something that is is much more horrific to me about this than you know, your standard jump scare in a Resident Evil or something like that. Not to knock Resident Evil, just <laughs> very different flavors. This is also a really interesting little microcosm. I don't think they go into much more than this, but thinking about like different religious sects and trying to adjudicate like the one true meaning of the religion or whatever. Um, like think about the wars and conflicts uh, and debates between you know, different branches of Christianity or something like that, right? Um, where these two worlds are mashed together and they each have their chosen one and they each have their sense of the Church of Martell uh, and they have to adjudicate what the true meaning of that is uh, oftentimes through the medium of trying to you know, bully people from the other side into submission or understanding and take someone like Phaedra in that unique position relative to one of the chosen ones to get them to back off. Oh, um, what about the controls ruined it for you? Yeah, I love Soma. Um, it sounds like you haven't seen my work on that. Um, I don't think I've written on it, but I, I lectured on it a few years ago. 
Uh, and actually speak of Matt McGill, who's coming to visit later this week, as I mentioned earlier in the stream. Uh, I, I know of Soma because back in college, he wrote a really cool uh, article sort of studying the sci-fi of it from a scientific perspective because he has a background in neuroscience. Um, but yes, long-winded way of saying, I know and have a lot of love for Soma, so I'm, I'm sorry to hear that the controls didn't sit well for you. What, uh, what was the hurdle with it, if I might ask? Oh, Sheena would be the perfect person to say that. An uplifting sentiment that would be just as home in the first game as in this one. On the other side of all the cynicism and sadness we've been dwelling on in this side quest. Oh, I'm glad we took the time and used the guide to find those scenes. I think that's yet another example of side content I missed back in the day. And, uh, just right for adding another dimension to the sequel. I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, I have to ask more people who played it, but I wouldn't be surprised if the side quest structure was part of what, um, like, made this game not especially well received back in the day, because I feel like a lot of the stuff that really adds interesting layers to it, juxtaposed against the first game, is kind of, um, relegated to side quests as opposed to stuff that you naturally encounter just going through the main story. Alright. Now I want to try to find a cat's for the next side quest. Oh, interesting. I wonder whether that was more of the control scheme that it uses or just the fact that it's a uh, like a relatively old game at this point, and so it's not like as um, finessed a control system as you would expect from a more modern game. I forget what year that was, maybe like, I don't know, my heart says 2011, but I'm totally talking out of my ass. Heavy Rain is one that I've never played in my library and on my list for obvious reasons. Um, how far did you get in Soma, if I might ask? So I want to modulate what I'm going to say based on what your experience was. There's a cat's quest that we're supposed to do in order to get something that's kind of important later in the story, but I'm not seeing it. I'm wondering whether we have to do some of the other ones in order for it to appear. So now we can try those quests, since we haven't done it in the game so far. Hopefully they are pretty simple. Yeah, okay, so I think that's far enough. All I was going to say was that um, I'm inclined to be more of an apologist for the controls in that game than in a game generally, just because I think part of what is interesting about it is that premise where your avatar is, like, not even himself, but a brain-scanned version of himself, like, uploaded into a robot body, which is on the face of it really interesting, but... You know, I would also almost want to mount an explanation of like, well, of course his you know, control over that body isn't going to be that precise. It's just think of the situation that he's in. I get your point from experience that those sorts of explanations can only go so far. But I think that sometimes they can uh, 
at least add a layer of value to controls that seem on the face of them not ideal in terms of what you'd be looking for. So it's a whole, it's a quest as in, you know, we actually have to go do all this side mission. I kind of thought it would be more like, um, like an idle game quest or something. Well then, I hope it doesn't take a lot of effort to find the one that we're supposed to do. Weak. You're right. Also, I might just put it off and hope we can access it later. Maybe that's why we felt that like one. on top of you after you get the item. Which I guess is part of the point, but I want to be able to avoid them. Oh, I have never heard of that game, but that sounds very interesting for sure. So what do you love about rain and thunderstorms so much? I mean, I guess. Any particular like memories with it, or is it just the overall aesthetic that leads to flow with you? Yeah, absolutely, I'll check it out. Add it to the uh the ever growing list of things to play. Oh, is my mic not balanced well? I'm sorry, I could turn it up or turn the game down. No, I was just asking you what it is about rain and thunderstorms that um, that you like, whether it's tied to a particular you know, sense memory or something, or if you're just a fan of the aesthetic. Uh, 
ever deeper. I ask, by the way, because I also absolutely love that aesthetic. Um, I know for me, a big part of it is it was growing up in Northern California, where it was oftentimes foggy or gray or misty outside. But I, I will always be happier in like cool, cloudy, rainy weather than on a day when it's way too hot and not a cloud in the sky and sun just beating down on you. Especially somewhere like where I'm living right now in Colorado, when the elevation is so significant that it always feels like 10 to 15 degrees hotter than the thermostat says it is now when the sun is out it's just oof, not my jam this will be easy let's finish this quickly God, I just I want this wolf, man. Give me a chance to get this wolf. And I'm very grateful that you're healing me, but in a much more real way. I'm very annoyed with it. Okay, there we go. You're so amazing. Shut up. No, I think you're totally on point. Are you kidding me? I'm not fighting anymore. I also feel like uh, I wish another buddy of mine, Nick, were here because he's really into poetry. And I can't, like, just cite a bunch of poems offhand. But I feel as though there are many great poems about that particular rainy, misty potential of nature that you're talking about. So I don't think it's just you. At the very least, it's the two of us. say it's a bummer having Evie because that's not true but one thing that is tough about having her uh, around the house is that she used to be okay with thunder but now I think what's happened is we live in a place where there are just way too many fireworks at way too many points in the year and I think she's gotten anxious about that and has then subsequently like transferred that anxiety over to also being anxious about thunder because it sounds similar. It's very sad. As much as I want to be able to enjoy that weather, half the time now I have to be comforting her because she'll be cowering in a corner over it. <laughs> You're so amazing. And that's not as fun. Shut up. That was nothing. I love the way you said that. God, it's a dead end. This will be easy. 
Let's finish this quickly. Okay, I'm absolutely not going to do another one of these quests right after this, so if we're able to find the one that advances the side quest, that's great. Otherwise, I'll look more into it after the stream and figure out how to get it done. That's it? I guess these would be nice if you really wanted to grind or if you really wanted to hunt specific monsters, but it just feels like needless side content in contrast with the, uh, the side content we just got at the Tefe Allen versus the Silveranti. This will be easy. Let's finish this quickly. Uh, Fourth of July, you know, that uh, holiday when we like to celebrate that little kerfuffle that we had with you Brits a few centuries ago. Um, and it's terrible because it's a thing all over the states to have fireworks for that, but for whatever reason, like the particular culture around where I live right now in Colorado, like literally they will start just like having people as individuals take it upon themselves to launch off fireworks at all hours of the day and night, even when it's light out and they can't fucking see the things. Like, a month to even six weeks before the 4th of July, and then they'll keep going through the rest of July. So it's like, probably close to a two-month period of just round-the-clock unlicensed fireworks. So, like, I'm I mean, I'm not a, a big guy on loud noises or that kind of fanfare in general, but I can definitely tolerate it for a holiday, but that sort of just nonsense surrounding the holiday, I have very little patience for. <laughs> That's okay, it's allowed. I'm, uh, I'm not exactly the beacon of patriotism, so... It's, it's easy for you to forget, I might imagine, when you're talking with me as opposed to other Americans. Yeah, the dickheads don't even really need an excuse. They'll make one up, right? I think you're right on the money about that. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's gonna be nuts. When is that? Is that coming up? I'm I'm so I I can barely pay attention to current events at all, but I'm very out of the loop when it comes to the Royals. This has got to be the last one. Oh, healing power! I'm begging you. Jesus! Not the fishy wombo combos. Oh, this Saturday, so very soon. Ah, buckle up. <laughs> You'll have to tell me next week on the stream how it was. If I don't uh, hear the celebration all the way from across the pond. got photon much later than rain got in memory serves I feel like that was one of rain's first spells Let's finish this quickly. 
Oh, that charge attack is kind of cool. Still an accident. I totally forgot about it. Of course, I won. Oh, I mean, I wouldn't call that rude. Like I said, I wouldn't call myself a royalist either. I don't know that I, uh, know anyone around Let's here who's this really feed into the royal family. Oh, try though. Yeah, try to tell me about it. I'm curious. Like, yeah, is, um, is the monarchy popular? Do a lot of people care about it? Or is it more of just, like, a sideshow? Or something more complicated and fraught? <laughs> That's kind of what I would have guessed. Not that I have much of a frame of reference for it. But uh, last year, I spent a little bit of time out there visiting another with a terrible fate analyst and mainstay, uh, my buddy Max Korinsky, and it kind of felt that way, um, that if anything, stuff like, you know, Buckingham Palace and the War of the Royals was more of a tourist attraction than something that locals were engaged with. This will be easy. Let's finish this quickly. Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. This dragon, this dragon. Yes, come on, can we get him? I would love a dragon. Should have never gone against me. That would make this whole sideshow adventure we're on almost worth it. Where dragon knows? Come on, think good vibes. Yes, awesome. Oh, he just curls up and go to sleep. That's my vibe. Oh my goodness! Wow, so that kind of strong feelings. Got it. <laughs> I guess I could imagine if I were Welsh feeling that way. Uh, yeah, I could. I could see where she was coming from. Yeah, that's, that's kind of exactly what I was thinking, like I can intellectualize it. A bit intense, but I can, I can understand. Excited, we have a dragon to raise now. And its name is Coral, what a cute name. I'm still not gonna do a bunch of these uh, quest dungeons, but that made this one. If we go back and check the quests, are there any new ones? I 
didn't even keep track from before, to be honest. If I leave and then I go again, will it show me new quests? Yeah, these are all the same. I'm gonna have to look into this more after the stream, because there's no way I'm doing a million of those as guesswork, but what it says in the guide, and I don't think I did this back in the day, is I think like the um like the optional super dungeon at the end of the game, similar to Nibelheim uh, in Tales of Symphonia, is accessible through like completing certain quests at certain parts of the story. And so I just really rather not miss that, but I'm also not going to blindly do quests hunting for the one that it says we have to do. So we'll advance the story a little and then see if that quest shows up. I don't think it's boring. I mean, I know very little about it, but based on what little I know, like I said, I can, uh, yeah, I can understand the sentiment at least. All right, well, we weren't able to figure out that quest, and the next side quest is later on, so let's advance the story that uh, medium-sized sideshow, let's say. And they're off. Shout out to Smidge telling us how to accelerate this world map traversal process last week, though, at least. So it doesn't take an hour to get to the other side of the world. easily a cat's in Maltokyo just to check if those quests were the same. So I didn't want to let it go yet. Now they're the same. That has me worried that we are going to have to complete a certain number before the quest that is actually required in order to like, unlock the special dungeon appears. Eh, we'll find out. But for now, let's go find Celeste. Celeste? Celeste? Uh, with all the, uh, the pronunciations they've changed in this game, it's anyone's guess. Welcome back. Ah, and Miss Sheena, you grace us with your presence. Uh, so we're continuing to chase Lloyd around the world, Chrissy, um, kind of in pursuit of him to try to find out what he's up to and also to beat him to the Centurion Corps since he's also collecting them and we're not sure why, but it's pretty clearly not for the reason that we are to awaken Ratatosk. Um, so I think I mentioned... As I recall, the last time we saw him was when we went to Flanor on the way to the Temple of Ice looking for Glacius's core, and it looked like the town had been sort of massacred, similar to what happened uh, in the Blood Purge at Palma Costa, and they were saying that Lloyd did it, and then we actually ran into him there, and he didn't really explain himself at all, and then he just went on his way. So he's still in the wind, and we are still kind of trying to find him as we also like hunt for the centurion course it's been a while sebastian and you would be sir emile miss Marta, and sir tenebrae correct 
Duke Bryant was good enough to send word ahead of your visit. Thank you. Yes. We've come about the Glacius' core. Uh, the various party members of the original party with Lloyd sort of all have their characteristic dispositions towards him in terms of how they're adjudicating, like, the Lloyd they knew on the journey versus what they're hearing about him now. But they're all still kind of at a loss as to understand what he's up to or what he's trying to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, Emil still, among everything else, blames him for the death of his parents. Um, and pretty much everyone uh, is in some level of doubt about him, at least, uh, whether or not they think he's a villain per se. Yes. Well, one of our servants, a man named Tokunaga, Definitely an informed us that he had come into possession of an unusual jewel. Isn't that the butler we saw coming out of the item shop? The same. It seems that he had just purchased the core when we saw him. Could you please call Mr. Tokunaga for us? Oh, what could that be? It, it, it's Lady Sellers. Lady Sellers has been kidnapped by Sir Lord. <laughs> See, Chrissy, the game heard you ask what was up with Lloyd. They knew it had been a minute. He's back. What? Sir Bud kidnapped Lady Sellers? <laughs> now, how's that for narrative continuity? The great Sir Bud. Sir Bud? Are you talking about Lloyd? We'll explain later. It's a Which whole way thing. did he go? Out the second floor window. We have to go after him. On it. Oh, okay, I guess Lloyd went out the second floor window, but we are not expected to. To the front door. Where is he? Tenebrae, can you sense Glockius around here? I do sense a presence getting further from here. However, energy from another Centurion's core is causing some interference. Could be Lumens, right? Lloyd has Lumens core. Another core? Like Lumens. Lloyd has that. Mm -hmm. No. This would be Solom's core, I believe. Oh, the Centurion of Earth. Why would Solom's core be here? And Tenebrae also felt like he was sensing Solom's core uh, back at the Temple of Ice, where he was similarly confused. Yeah, I probably spoke a little quickly there. What I meant more was, like, not that he didn't have presence of mind, but there are some characters and heroes and leaders who are gifted at subterfuge and sort of, you know, masking their intentions with their actions. And part of what I've always appreciated about sort of the fabric of Lloyd's character as he's presented in the first Tales of Symphonia is that he seems very straightforward, like, do what you say and say what you do. Um, with his dwarven vows and his give you your name and I'll give you mine and just his his ethos. So uh, just the, the kind of deviousness and machinations that we're thinking about in this game in that sense strike me as a little uncharacteristic of him. Hopefully that's a little bit fairer. <laughs> we can wonder about that later. Let's split up and start searching. Now we gotta search all of Mel Tokyo. And Mel Tokyo is large. Say, yeah. I wonder what she's up to. I wonder if she looks older now. She was supposed to start aging again, right? I 
guess it's only been two years though. <laughs> well, I think the first Tales of Symphonia was a little uneven in terms of its own treatment of it. Like there were definitely some bits that were playing off of him being seemingly simple minded or not, you know, being uh, in on the joke or what the party was talking about. <laughs> But no, that's uh, that's not what I would describe as the fiber of Lloyd's character. <laughs> I can see why you would think that was unfair. No, he's he's uh, there's definitely something going on in between his ears. Isn't the chosen? Whoa! Excuse you. It's you, Celos Wilder. Huh? Never expected to see you in my neck of the woods. We don't have time for that. Lloyd kidnapped your sister. What are you talking about? It's true. Lloyd. Lloyd Irving. I. I've been waiting for you. Oh, he's back. <laughs> the knobhead himself. <laughs> Damn it. I lost him. He knobbed and robbed. You're right off with Celeste. <laughs> no, I know you do. Of course. I'd appreciate a good Are you rip. blind? Don't make me laugh. That's not Lloyd. You idiot. Your sister's been kidnapped. Hmm. Don't get your britches in a bunch, kid. Lloyd wouldn't do something like that to sell us. That was not Lloyd. Where are you going? I think that is the first case we've had of someone who, uh, who traveled with Lloyd being entirely convinced that it was not Lloyd they were even talking about. I'm, I'm sure going home. Did. If someone's gone to all the trouble of kidnapping Celis, I'm sure they left me some sort of message. Okay, Celis, not Celis. You come too. You want to see Lloyd, right? Yeah, well put. Master Zelos, Lady Zelos has been... Yeah, and, and not really the character from the original party I would have pegged for having that kind of just boundless, unshakable trust in Lloyd, but as he says it now, it kind of makes sense to me and resonates with his character as we saw it in the first game. The kid already filled me in. Especially as we saw it in the first game with the outcome of, uh, of Zelos coming back and saving everyone from Crucius versus uh, choosing the path that brings Kratos back, as we talked about. Duke Bryant and Miss Sheena are currently out looking for Lady Celis. Regal and Sheena? It looks like Lloyd's already skipped town. Oh. Marta. Emil. Sebastian, tell me exactly what happened. I was the one who witnessed it, Master Zelos. I had presented Lady Celis with an exceptional gem called the Glockius. I had just begun explaining its origins when it happened. Yeah, it does say a lot. I'm not sure what it says. It doesn't sit super well with me, but... I don't know. I guess it would be hard, especially when a lot of them seem not to have 
like seen or spent a lot of time with Lloyd over the last two years to like have this person whom you feel as if you know very well uh, but then hear these very out of character things about them from people who otherwise seem trustworthy I mean it would be hard to wrestle with that enough to imagine so Lloyd suddenly came in through the window he grabbed Lady Celis along with the gem and escaped you mean Lloyd has Glaucius's core? But it does. It kind of makes Zellos like unexpectedly admirable <laughs> in a uh, in a way that wasn't on my Zellos's character being fleshed out in a sequel bingo card. I'm sorry, Marta. If only I caught him. And there's been no word from Lloyd. We have yet to hear anything. That's weird. What's so weird about it? Lloyd's after all of the cores. And why go to the trouble of kidnapping Celis? I'm telling you, that's not Lloyd. You're wrong. It was Lloyd. I saw him with my own eyes. What would you know about Lloyd anyway? You really think he smells like that? Yeah, no, I think you're right. That strikes me as the right impression. Smell? Yep. When he ran by me, there was this horrible stench. I thought mm. I was going to pass out. Well, not so much conviction then as uh, a good nose. Boy, this was a real whirlwind we just went through with Zellos. <laughs> I feel like I just went from really being surprised and impressed by his character to much more just, oh no, the, the man just has a really cute sense of smell, which <laughs> is more consistent with the Zellos I know and in some senses love. Lloyd's never been the sort to work alone. And even if he was, he'd never put on something that putrid. Circle gets square. Ah. And now suddenly light dawns, and Chrissy, for your benefit, because I know you've been following the stream, and um, you missed when we discovered this, though I said it at the, uh, the beginning in terms of my sum up. So Dex, the, uh, one of the Vanguard guys we met over the last couple streams, uh, infamous for his very putrid smelling cologne. And we saw him shapeshift to take on the guise of Marta's father in order to lure her through the Temple of Ice, so... He's got the stench and he's got the shape-shifting. Now that you mention it, it did smell a bit familiar. Was it owed a seduction? That's it. Mm. Wait, that would mean Dex was disguised as Lloyd? This is also funny because I'll, uh, I'll toot Dan's horn because he's not here to defend himself and I'm sure he wouldn't mind. But if you're ever wondering how deep he is in just familiarity with JRPGs and anime. He joined me for all of three streams, and before I had even remembered that Dex was going around po posing as Lloyd, he, like, he met the character of Dex, he saw the sequences I was telling you about, he learned all about Lloyd in the first game and what was happening with Lloyd in this game, and he was just like, oh, okay, so Dex is impersonating Lloyd, <laughs> which, like, I still hadn't even remembered that, and I had played the game before, so... I don't know if that makes me look bad or Dan look good. Maybe a little bit of both. <laughs> I won't dwell on it. Hey, you guys want to enlighten the rest of us as to what you're talking about? Um, well, you see... Hmm, Ratatosk, huh? I gotta say, that's quite the tale. So anyway, there's a good chance the Lloyd we saw was actually this Vanguard guy Dex in disguise. Judging from the smell, I think so. All right, come with me for an audience with his majesty. Let Regal and Sheena know when they come back. Understood. An audience? The House of Wilder is second in status only to the royal family. We have to report this immediately. Let's go. <laughs> That's it. He's attuned to the cosmic vibrations of the JRPG story. to the castle. <laughs> Maybe it's a panacea in terms of like, it smells so bad it knocks you out and then when you finally come to, all of your ailments have been cured. <laughs> Chosen one, 
I'm told that Bud has kidnapped Celis. <laughs> oh, I love that. Now they've even got the king of Tethayala calling Lloyd Bud. <laughs> to be more accurate, your majesty, she was taken by an imposter of his. We believe the vanguard may be involved. Very sus. Excuse me, why do you call him Bud? It's a long story. Because he's my Bud. I guess it wasn't that long of a story. You say those barbarians who call themselves the Silverante Liberation Front committed this crime? How awful! <sighs> Your Majesty, Duke Bryant and Sheena Fujibayashi of Mizuho have arrived. I would speak with them. It seems matters have become quite grave. Your Majesty, we come bearing new information about the current situation. Scouts from my village reported seeing a rayard overhead flying east. East of here? That could be the Cape Fortress. Marta? The Vanguard has a base in the Cape Fortress. So, Marta dear, how do you know something like that? M well... It's simple. I am the Vanguard. Former Vanguard, huh? A member of the Vanguard? Stop, please! Marta has nothing to do with the Vanguard anymore. And right now, my sister's life is more important. Put away your weapons! So far, the Vanguard hasn't made any attempt to contact me regarding my sister's kidnapping. Which is why I suspect they've abducted Celis in order to get to Lloyd rather than me. Why would they do that? Emil, the Vanguard's after the Corps too, correct? That would include whatever Corps Lloyd has. I see. They took Celis so they can make a trade with Lloyd. Well, it could just be coincidence. Celis came in possession of the core. They set out to steal it and ended up grabbing her when they realized she'd be useful so as it well. It is important to keep in mind that while well, we know there's a Lloyd imposter now, until we catch up with the real Lloyd and better understand what he's up to, it's still very unclear. Which incidents of Lloyd doing things were an imposter versus him and what his actual motivations were. And there is still some stuff up in the air about all this. Dex, how could he? We'll need to infiltrate the Vanguard's base. Your Majesty, in case our plan should fail, I would request the Royal Army be ready to take up the search for Celis. Of course. I'll have my generals make the necessary preparations immediately. As for Mizuho... I've already asked my people to start a search. Excellent. But chosen one, shouldn't you consider staying behind in the city? If I don't get some thrills in now and then, I'll grow old before my time. Well then, your majesty, we will take our leave. To save Celis. Um, I'd like to say something before we go. Is something the matter? I'm sorry. I, I go fucking nuts sometimes. I still don't really get it. I'm a working. What in are progress. you apologizing for? It's about Lloyd. I've been thinking. What if all of these terrible things I've been blaming on Lloyd were actually done by his imposter? Oh, it's not even about his crazy ratatosk rage mode. It's just about as much more human thing of blaming Lloyd quite blindly for something that he might not have been responsible for. Emil! I don't know. Maybe this is the only time it's his imposter. Of course, it could turn out that the real Lloyd is responsible for this. But every time I hear one of Lloyd's friends talk about him, it's hard to believe he's the same person who did all of those terrible things. So... I appreciate what you're trying to say, but we have no idea what the truth is. Yes, I know. It's just, I finally realized I can't jump to conclusions when there's so much doubt about what's happened. That's why I wanted to say I'm sorry. Then let's call a truce. When you gave me the evil eye, I pegged you as just some punk. But now that I've gotten to know you, you're a pretty decent kid. Zelos, you don't have to talk like that. It was probably a meal in Ratatosk mode that gave you the evil eye. Yeah, we should... Uh, are we gonna, like, have a roundtable discussion about that whole thing at some point? 
Indeed, it seems that Emil gets a bit abrasive when he enters this so-called Ratatos the mode. craziness at the Temple of Darkness that we're still not really talking. Ah, it won't come up again. Now nah, we can just, ah, we'll just, don't worry about that. It's nothing. Stop it. Stop talking about the other Emil like that. That Emil is Emil too, and he's doing the best he can. So please stop talking about him like mm. this. Ah, right. I'm sorry. That's not quite what I would have expected from Marta. Yes, I'm afraid I went too far as well. I'm sorry, Emil. So her relationship with the other Emil is starting to evolve a little bit. No, I'm fine. Well, moving on. I think it's about time we left. Sorry to rush you all, but I'm worried about Celis. Yes, I'm sorry for delaying. Let's get moving. I don't care if they're the vanguard or what. Anybody who even looks at Celis the wrong way is going to answer to me. After I string them up by their necks from the summit of Mount Fuji, I'll tie them to a sack of bricks and dump them into Flanor Harbor. Oof. Wow, Regal and Sheena weren't kidding. Yeah. What did they say? They said you cared a lot about your sister. That you'd never forgive anybody who hurt her. Essentially, they said you seem to have a thing for your sister. Regal, Sheena, come here a sec. No. That's not what we meant. Tenebrae, the lord of the paraphrasing. <laughs> what I'm saying is Emil loves his mom, Zelos loves his sister, and I'm hilarious. And very hip and not an old fool. Oh, why hello, Miss Jubilees. I see you're keeping that sumptuous body of yours in top shape. Say it again and I'll smack you. Ow! You always want Zelos me is lord of the it. sus, Chrissy. Nice we know to this. see you haven't changed, Sheena. Nice to see you still can't have a conversation without slobbering over breasts. The Chosen's personality is the picture of constancy. You haven't changed That's what I'm yourself, saying. Duke Bryant. Chosen, we just saw each other the other day at the salon of Countess Rattenmeyer. He was checking out her voluptuous aristocratic curves, no doubt. What's that, Sheena? Do I detect a note of jealousy? What? It's almost as if they'd never been apart. Voluptuous and aristocratic. It is, I gotta see. Oh, can I finally get into the item shop now to restock? Or is it still forbidden? No, it is forbidden. All right, friendos. Well, I think that's a good moment on the cusp of the Celis rescue to call it for the evening. I learned a lot about who might or might not be Lloyd, who might or might not be Emil, this whole Ratatosk mode with whom we got to spend uh, quite a bit of time in the Temple of Darkness. That wonderfully timely uh, confrontation with Richter where I got to go from thinking about the Einsoff in Tales of the Abyss this morning uh, to about it and so many other uh, intellectual and philosophical disciplines in Dawn of the New World, which I hadn't even remembered. So we're hitting that sweet spot in the middle of the story where things are starting to come into focus. We're getting some twists and turns. We'll see what's coming next. Uh, some of it remem I remember, some of it I clearly don't. So we're discovering things along the way. Yeah, thank you, Christy. It was great to have you back. Hope to see you again on Wednesday. Uh, we'll be here at the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. Show up for some Dawn of the New World. Hope you get a chance to check out the new uh, flagship article and study on withaterriblefate.com as well. Uh, right smack dab on the homepage, all about Tales of the Abyss. So if you want to dive further into a celebration and study of the Tales series storytelling, look at it through the lens of why it can be really personally and spiritually meaningful to so many players, myself included, and maybe even yourself included, uh, I do hope you check that out. Yeah, reach out to me if you have any thoughts on it. Happy to discuss it on stream. Might do some kind of conversation uh, with Dan for the site about it as well. So until then, hope you game well. Hope you enjoy some other great stories and I'll hope to see you back here on Wednesday. Thanks everyone.